Okay, greetings and welcome. This is Senior English B, and we are now interested in brief introductory observations to what we will call the Victorian era. If you look at your table of contents in your textbook, and you needn't do this, but if you were to look at your table of contents in your textbook, you would find that that textbook is divided up into six units. In Senior English A, we are addressing units one, two, and three. In Senior English B, the course you are now sitting in, we address units four, five, and six. We have just finished with unit four, the romantics. The romantics. We began, you may recall, with poets such as Blake, and Wordsworth and Coldrich's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, along with Kubla Khan, of course. We then finished with those three young Hellion poets, as we often will refer to them, that you're writing now a paper over, Byron, Shelley, and Keats. When we finish with Keats, we then move from the Romantic era to unit number five, the Victorians. The Victorians. Now the question, Ms. Swalstead, that must be asked is, what is different about the time period referenced in Unit 4 versus the time period referenced in Unit 5, the Victorians? Like, you know, what's the deal? Let's point out, at no given point, remember we began our romantic discussion by giving a round figure date of what? Do you remember? It was an easy date for us to remember. What was our date? Do you remember? Write it down. What was the date of the Romantics? Does anyone remember? Lyrical Ballads will actually be published very close to this single round date. Mr. Brown, do you remember it? 1800, yes, 1800, very simple. So what are we doing when we talk about the Victorians? Well, you're looking right there at those opening pages. What are the dates that they will give to you for the Victorian period? And I believe Mr. Nelson is right on that page. Mr. Nelson, those dates are what? 1832 to 1901. See, so we're basically talking about, let's give it a simple round date. Notice how I like these round dates. Let's call it 1850, shall we? Because if we call the Romantic period 1800, we can talk about the, the, the Victorian period as roughly 1850. The truth of the matter is we're going to probably talk more about it as 1880, all right, when we start to really to get into it. But we'll go ahead and say 1850 just because that's an easy round figure. In other words, 50 years or so into this area that we call the Romantics. Now let's point out something, Mr. Keeley. It's not like one morning in 1799. Everyone woke up on the continent and in England and big neon lights went off all over the universal sky and said, you are now leaving the age of reason and entering the age of romanticism. And conversely, in some time around 1850 or so, your hymnal says 1830, again, the neon blinking lights went off like in Vegas and went, we are now leaving the romantic period and moving into the age of the Victorians. Let's go ahead and say something out loud. The naming of these epochs, of these eras, happen after the fact. They don't happen during the time. When you're living in a time period, you very rarely understand its importance, and you rarely are therefore able to name it, right? So for example, most of you were born in what year? 19 and what? 94, 95, 96, is that roughly when you were born, right in that time? Did I say it about right? Let's call it 1995, just for a round figure. 1995, <coughs> five years before the new century is ready to begin, right? You were an infant newly born. In Warland High School in 1995, this old man was here, you see. And I can tell you that in 1995, it was a big dog deal if anybody owned a cell phone. No kidding. Very few of my students had computers at home that were their own. If there was a computer at home, it was the family computer, and you had to do this thing called booting it up, you see. Now, see, so you live in a time 
of radically different technological changes, the obvious question is, when they look back 100 years from now to 1995, what are they going to say about that time period that you were born into? They might say it was a time of radical, radical change. Well, we won't know that for a hundred years. I mean, we're aware of it now. Let's be fair. We're aware of it now. But we won't know its importance until a hundred years from now. Does that make sense? Right? Some people might write that the year you were born, 1995, was the last chance America ever had as an industrial nation. See, we won't know that for a long time. Then there will be a name that's kind of applied or given to it. I will point out, though, that this naming of epochs becomes a big dog deal roughly 1600. At about 1600, the Renaissance as a phrase starts to be used. And from that time on, they start to kind of want to name these epochs. Now, the reason we call it the Victorian era is actually pretty simple. It has to do with the person who was sitting on the throne in England whose name was Victoria. See, that makes sense. So that's why we call it the Victorian period. But I'm going to have, I think, a little easier way for us to wrap our brain around this time that we call the Victorian period. The key is what we call the Industrial Revolution. So write that phrase down on your notes, the Industrial Revolution. Now here's the problem for us, Mr. Brown. We can come to school and fill out worksheets and leave school and never have any real sense of the history we are talking about. You know what I mean? We can get A's in our history class, we can pass out with a pat on our back and our little cord on the top of our goofy looking hat gets pushed to the other side, and we, not, we can't even answer a simple question like, what was the Industrial Revolution? Right? So what I'm going to try to do, as I have done for years, is to give you a word picture that somehow allows you to be able to understand better this time period that we call the Industrial Revolution. All right? Now, what is the Industrial Revolution? That's the question that I'm going to ask. And for that, I need you to just simply set down your pens and pencils because you needn't take any notes. If my word picture, Mr. Frederick, does anything right, it will hopefully aid you uh, enough to remember this word picture. <laughs> I want you to imagine that one morning, early in the morning, in a small town outside of London, Mr. Nelson gets up to go to work. Mr. Nelson works at a shoe factory making shoes. He gets up in the morning, he gets ready to go, he kisses his wife, Miss Keller, goodbye. And he kisses his eight children goodbye. Mr. Nelson and Miss Keller have been busy, shall we say. And off he goes to his job at the shoe factory. Mr. Keller, or Mr. Nelson, however, is in for a surprise. He gets to just within 100 yards of his shoe factory, where he's been working, by the way, all his life. His daddy before him worked at that same shoe factory. And guess what? His granddaddy worked at the same shoe factory where they made by hand shoes. Wow, they were pretty good at it. Mr. Nelson is, in fact, one of the better shoe cobblers in the factory. But when he gets within 100 yards of the building, he notices something different this Monday morning. There are large numbers of men standing milling around the front door. He is like uncertain as to what's going on. And as he walks up, one of his pals is walking back the other way with tears in his eyes. Mr. Nelson is like, what in heaven's name is going? And the guy says, there's a sign on the door. I hope your name ain't on it. What do you mean a sign on the door? I hope my name is on What are you talking about? Mr. Nelson says, there's some of us that lost our jobs over the weekend in the shoe factory. Mr. Nelson is like, well, that can't be me because my great granddaddy worked at this factory. My grandpa worked here. My daddy worked here and I work here. And besides that, I have eight children at home with Miss Keller waiting to be fed when I come home later today. I can't lose my job. And he walks up to look at the name of 150 guys whose names are on this little piece of paper. Mr. Nelson scanning for his name the way other men are standing who have not yet seen their names and are walking away. And Mr. Nelson is the third name from the bottom. His name is on the paper. 
Now let's point out one or two important things about this moment. And now you can start getting ready to take notes. Mr. Nelson has no recourse to law. He can't go get himself a lawyer and say, I got fired illegally. I am going to sue the shoe factory. Uh, no option here at this time. Mr. Nelson has no government help of any kind he might be able to resort to. Well, it's okay if I'm in between jobs. Maybe I can get some kind of unemployment wages until I can go. No, no government programs of any kind. No help for food, no help for medical of any kind. That does not exist in 1850 for Mr. Nelson. But Mr. Nelson is actually not that upset yet. Here's why. He's a good shoemaker guy. He's been doing it all his life. He says, well, that's simple enough. I'll just go down the street to the other shoe factory because in the neighborhood in which he lives, there are a number of shoe factories. I'll just go down the street. I've been a very good shoemaker guy for a very long time. They'll hire me there. And I'll just go home and tell my wife and eight children that I changed jobs, but I'm still getting paid. Only problem is that when Mr. Nelson shows up at the shoe factory half mile down the road, there's 200 names on the list on that door that on that morning we're told, you don't work here at our shoe factory anymore. Now Mr. Nelson is in serious trouble. See, now there's some things that you need to know that Mr. Nelson does not know. And I'm going to pull back the curtain now and let you know what happened. First of all, the owner of the shoe factory where Mr. Nelson worked until he didn't, the owner of that shoe factory was Mr. Brown. Mr. Oh. Brown was actually handed over the shoe factory just a few years before when his father came to him and said, it is now time for you to run the family the family uh, factory. And this factory, this shoemaking factory, has been in the business for a number of generational years. Don't screw it up. It's kind of like saying, don't wreck the ambulance. Mr. Brown has been told, whatever you do, don't screw it up. Mr. Brown is a good shoe factory owner guy. He even knows, kind of, about Mr. Nelson. He knows him well enough that he's periodically able to say to him, good morning, Mr. Nelson. And Mr. Nelson will say back to Mr. Brown, good morning, Mr. Brown. And Mr. Brown will then say, how is that beautiful wife of yours and your eight beautiful children doing? Mr. Brown is at least tuned into Mr. Nelson's life well enough to know that much about Mr. Nelson. Let's just point out though, Mr. Nelson is aware that Mr. Brown does not live in the neighborhood where the factory is, where Mr. Nelson lives. That Mr. Brown, in fact, lives in a different neighborhood, and he has his own parking spot at the country club. A, a country club, let's point out, Mr. Nelson has never been to. He's heard about, but he's never been to. But, let's be fair, every Christmas, Mr. Brown will usually give Mr. Nelson and his wife and eight children a bonus of a few extra dollars, to which Mr. Nelson and his wife and eight children will usually say something kind in the prayer over the Christmas duck, uh, you know, before they all dig in, you see, uh, to say thank you to Mr. Brown for making this feast possible. But I must continue. What Mr. Nelson doesn't know is that a couple of days before his name got stuck on a list, Mr. Brown was sitting alone in his office. He was running figures. He was a bit concerned about the, you know, the figures, but he had always worked hard to make the numbers match up in the end, and the company is still doing okay. Barging through the door, walking through the door, is a well-dressed gentleman, top hat, and a little briefcase. Mr. Harder walks through the door of Mr. Brown's office. He didn't, this is important, he didn't even knock. He just pushes the door open and Mr. Harder walks in. I should point out, Mr. Harder is not English. Mr. Harder is from Boston. He's American. He walks through the, the door of the office and he says, I don't have much for time. Basically, I've got five minutes. You're going to hear what I have to say, and then I'm leaving. I'm from Boston. We have made a machine that can make shoes, and it does a great job. You need to buy the machine that we've made in Boston. 
If you buy this machine immediately, you can get rid of 150 of your labor force because this machine can do it and it works around the clock and it does it better. Immediately, Mr. Brown is in a quandary. First of all, he didn't even knock. That is to say, he doesn't even understand proper manners. But then how could he? He comes from across the Atlantic over there where they don't know about manners. Number two, he's ready to tell Mr. Harder, up oh, yours, I don't need your machine. But Mr. Harder preempts him and says, now I know you may be thinking about not purchasing my machine and that's quite all right because here's the deal. I am about to leave your office and I am going down the street to your competitor, Mr. Judice, who owns your other factory. Mr. Judice and I have already met. He's buying two of these machines. If you don't buy one of these machines, Mr. Brown, Mr. Judice will bury you in the next year. You can do whatever you want to do. I need your decision, though, in three minutes. Now, here's the thing. Right. Here's the thing. Mr. Nelson has no idea about this when he visits his uh, shoe factory job on Monday morning. No idea at all. When he shows up, he just sees his name on a list. He has no idea that this transaction occurred a few days prior where Mr. Brown saw the back of Mr. Harder as he left his room. And Mr. Harder's final word was, you're not going to regret this. I got a boat to catch to get back to New York City and Boston. It's called the Titanic. You might have heard of it. <laughs> and that's the last that that's the last that Mr. That's the last that Mr. Brown will ever see of Mr. Harder and his briefcase and his stupid American accent and his let's just say what it is, arrogance. Mr. Brown is he, he's so disgusted by this chap's arrogance. I mean, he walks in, he makes demands, he tells Mr. Brown what Mr. Brown is going to do, he predicts Mr. Brown's economic future if he doesn't buy the machine, and off he goes. Well, let's just point out a couple of observations real quick. Clearly, Mr. Brown made his decision. By the way, he didn't ever explain to Mr. Nelson why, as the same can be said of Mr. Judice's factory. Never explain why. They just showed up on Monday morning and there were names on a list that said, you ain't got no job no more. Now, I'm ready for you to go to work on your notes. That, by the way, is the famed, less than famous, shoe factory story. See, here's the thing, Mr. Judice, we can fill out worksheets all day long about the Industrial Revolution and it mean absolutely nothing to us. But now I've given you a word picture to help you understand what the Industrial Revolution is all about. Let's go to work with it now. First question. Why do you think Brown, and later Judice, decided to listen to Harder and buy the machine? Just jot down answers here. Why do you think ultimately they make the decision? Let's point out, Mr. Brown and Mr. Judice are not bad guys. Like I said, Mr. Brown and Mr. Nelson know each other fairly well. In fact, if you were to poll Mr. Nelson prior to the Monday when he lost his job, he would say about Mr. Brown, he's a pretty decent guy. You know, he's a decent enough man. Once when a terrible thing fell on my foot and I was, you know, jacked up for a week or two, he actually gave me a couple of dollars to help me get through. He's a pretty decent guy. So why would this really decent guy decide to lay off 150 of his, of his workforce He doesn't want to lose everything. The fact that he's going to obviously lose 150 workers is nothing compared to the 500 workers that remain in the shoe factory, right? That is to say, you got to let some of them go so that he can remain competitive. Why would he worry about being competitive? What do you mean? He has a factory where he's been making shoes. What is it about Mr. Harder's visit that changes a whole bunch of the way Brown thinks about his shoe factory? Yeah. <coughs> Competition, right? Let's write that word down. That's an important word. Mr. Brown knew about Mr. Judice and competition, but guess what? Mr. Harder throws a whole different kind of wrench into that project. Here's why. Mr. Harder shows up and says two things. One, we're doing it this way back in Boston. Two, well, Mr. Judice is going to buy these machines. And if you don't, you ain't going to have no shoe factory. And Mr. Brown is aware that one of the last things his daddy said to him before he passed away was, don't wreck the ambulance. That's right. Don't screw it up, boy. We've been working a long time to make sure that we have a shoe factory that's profitable and you like your special parking spot at the country club. Don't screw it up. So Mr. Brown in some ways will feel as if he doesn't have a choice. So, now let's go to Mr. Nelson. 
It's at this point our shoe factory story starts to become a little bit more real. I want you to play out real quickly what happens for Nelson. I want you to try and crawl inside of his brain for a second and think about the kinds of emotions he's going to go through. What will be his first emotion? Probably hatred. Rage. Anger. How dare Mr. Brown do this to me? And not just to me, but what? To Miss Keller and his eight children. Remember, Miss Keller doesn't work a job. Her job is to take care of eight kids at home. See, right? It's Mr. Nelson who has the job. And that is job enough, let's just point out. That and picking up after Mr. Nelson, who is, Miss Keller reports, a complete slob. <laughs> That's what she said. I'm just telling you what she said. I wouldn't want to make things up, you see. <laughs> So, rage is our first emotion. What's our next emotion? Right? What's our second emotion? We're going to move from anger, rage, down that continuum to uncertainty, disappointment, fear, depression. Why depression? Because you ain't got no job. So he'll just go get a different job. Wait a minute. Think about skill sets. What is it that Mr. Nelson is good at? He's really good at, he's good at one thing. He's good at one thing, right? He's good at one thing. He can make shoes really well. If he can't get a job making shoes, what is he skill trained to do? The answer is nothing, nothing, right? Here's why. Mr. Nelson is going to go home and tell his oldest son. Think before you say it, write it down. What will Mr. Nelson's advice to his oldest son B when he goes home. Don't say it, write it. What's Mr. Nelson's going, uh, advice going to be to his oldest son? As he goes home to his boy, what's he going to say to his boy about the future? This experience for Mr. Nelson will have taught Mr. Nelson something fundamental about his life and the future. What advice is he going to give to his boy that his daddy probably, Mr. Nelson's daddy, probably never gave to him? Mr. Nelson's daddy worked at the shoe factory. Nelson now works at the shoe factory. Hey. What's he going to tell his son? When Nelson walks through the door, what's he going to tell his boy after he tells him, son, today I got to tell you what happened. Daddy don't work at no shoe factory no more. Keep going. Now what's he going to tell his boy? about the future. What advice is he going to give his son? By the way, this is central to understanding the Industrial Revolution. Pivotal. What's he going to tell him, Judice? I'd say uh, you need to be more rounded in your skill set. Keep going, keep going with that, that word. I mean, he's brilliant. Mr. Judice says more rounded. But I, I, want, well, I want a single word. I want a single word. What is it that Mr. Nelson is going to tell his son? Boy, it might have never meant a thing to me in my life, but I can absolutely guarantee you what's coming in the future. What is it? Education. You better get one. And you better get one fast because here's what. I can't predict the future, but I can predict one thing for sure. Daddy ain't got no job tomorrow at the shoe factory. And I took a, I took a walk. I about wore out my shoes today in all the shoe factories. Guess what? They all of them laid off people. See, Harder did his job well before he got on that boat back from New York City. See how that works? <laughs> Unfortunately, the ride didn't turn out very well for Harder, but oh well. <laughs> when Mr. Brown read about it in the Post, he thought, well, that's just poetic justice. But wait a minute, let's stick with Brown and Harder for just a moment. Because let's point out something. Even though Harder didn't make it back to New York, Mr. Brown is pretty much sure there ain't, there ain't just one Harder back in Boston. Wait a minute. Some of you are now starting to think on a whole different level. Wait a minute. What goes through Brown's head once Harder has left? And you got to think here for a little bit, because this is foundational to understanding the Industrial Revolution. Where did I say Harder was from? He's from the United States. We're in 1850. 1850 minus 100 years is 1750. Tommy and his pals wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We studied that document as juniors, a document of what year? 
1776, just a few years after 1750. And that document was called the Declaration of Independence. Independence from who? From the British. From the British. Remember? We're going to do the whole Revolutionary War thing over this fight with the British. Hey, stay with me. This is crucial to hear what I'm saying. Brown is aware of English history. Brown is English. He owns an English factory. A hundred years after the Declaration of Independence, harder, they figured it out. They Think about this, guys. If Harder is coming into Brown's office to sell him a machine that they made in Boston, when Brown starts thinking about it, what's his one reality about shoes being made somewhere else in the world? What? Think about it. Right. If Americans are ingenious enough to invent a machine that can make shoes that allows them to not have to pay employers so much, then obviously they're going to start making better shoes than us and faster. Then they can invent Walmart. Then they can sell those shoes. And guess what happens to Mr. Brown? Are you ready for this? Whether he buys Harder's machine or not. Lying in bed at night, Nelson is just worried about the next day's money, job. He's going to tell his son, dude, you better get an education and fast. Let's point out right away, Nelson's going to have to go get some crappy job, right, whatever he can find. But immediately think about the, the way that his family will dramatically change. Immediately, Miss Keller's got to go get a job somewhere. Immediately, those children have got to get sent out to go, to go work. Am I right about this? Right? Right? The reality is, the reality is there is one word which will define all of the different players of this event. And that one word starts with a C. Write it down in your notes if you can get it. C H A N G E. And we ain't talking about 10 cents out of the dollar change, are we? We're talking about a change in regards to the fundamental understanding of life. Let's just say it, hello? Let's just say it now. Brown goes to bed that night as Nelson goes to bed that night. They're both English. And they go to bed that night thinking, uh-oh, uh-oh. Brown for different reasons than Nelson. Nelson's just worried about the job the next day. Brown is worried about 20 years from now. How many more times am I going to have Harder or his light come through my door demanding I buy machines, and if I don't buy them, he's going to sell them three times faster to Judice, and I'm going to lose my factory to Judice because he's buying. Of course, think about it. At any given moment, Judice and Brown have got to accept if Harder is selling these machines, sooner or later, he won't need to show up to sell us the machines. He'll just bury us. And it'll be over. And the, and the factory will shut down. And how's Brown going to explain that one? I lost the family factory because somebody across the ocean made a machine I couldn't make. And I didn't know, I couldn't buy it. I, he, could, he charged me too much for it, etc., etc. See how that works? The Industrial Revolution radically changes everything about European life now. Nelson will never, can we say this? No matter what job he ever gets from this point on. He will never feel secure again in his life, will he? No. Because any job he's got, he knows. I could lose it just like that, huh? All right. When we come back tomorrow now, we'll ask about the poetic response to Mr. Nelson and Miss Keller and their eight children. And their eight children. Wow.